I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how important I think electrochemistry will be in uh, the coming decades. Um, and it's really uh, something that has begun to dawn on me since I left uh, being Secretary of Energy. So I'm going to talk very, very briefly about some new risks to climate change. Uh, I'm going to go to rapidly changing lands uh, landscape of energy and the role of electrochemistry. So here's the risks. This is uh, relatively old data. It's the average global temperature from 1880 until 2017 or 16 really. And the thing that I want you to pay particular attention to was it's only since 1975 that this has really come out of the noise and since 1975, we've uh, warmed up by about one degree centigrade. One degree centigrade does not sound like a lot, but if you wind the clock backwards to a time when the ice ages were here and the uh, all of Canada, United States, down to Ohio, Pennsylvania was covered all year round in ice. So if you can imagine a couple of degrees warmer on the other direction, it would be dramatically different. We are already one degree warmer than we were, or one in the third degrees warmer than we were since before the Industrial Revolution, and um, it's likely we're going to get significantly hotter. And so, for example, if you ask simple questions, are the glaciers melting, is the sea level rising? The simple answer is yes. Let me describe very briefly how we measure this. It's very neat. We have precision satellites, a pair of satellites that go around the Earth in polar orbit. And so if the mass locally in the Earth changes, and in, the, in this cartoon you see that white sheet being Greenland, and so if the ice mass in Greenland melts and changes, it actually perturbs the satellite orbits. And you measure the, these satellites, and especially the distance between the satellites, so if they go around the, and they go like that, you say, aha, something's changing. But they go around over and over again in polar orbit. But in addition to the um, perturbing of the orbits, there's something else that also happens. The ice has mass, and so when it melts, the ground is elastic and it springs back. And so you also have to measure very accurately um, that uh, elastic deformation. So we use laser and high-frequency microwaves, but mostly lasers to do that. So these satellites can measure distances between themselves, that first pair, uh, to a small fraction of the width of a human hair. And also uh, the land mass height, uh, again, to a, um, uh, microns. So when you back this out, you can actually measure changes in ice thickness to millimeters when averaged over, uh, let's say, 50, 100 kilometers. So it's very accurate, and it covers all the Earth. And um, what was disturbing was a paper published in 2009 that said Antarctica is seeming to melt. That was a shock. With higher temperatures, uh, there's supposed to be more rain, more snow, but in Antarctica, because it's so cold, it should accumulate ice. But instead, especially Western Antarctica, was losing mass, and if you average over the whole continent, it's been losing mass and it's been, ex been accelerating, so it's not only losing mass, but the second derivative is also increasing, as is Greenland, and um, it's running off. So here's a bit of history. In the last warm period, which was only two degrees warmer than we are at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, one degree warmer than we are today, uh, the we have uh, a measure of sea level. Now, how do we get this? It's because there's critters that live at the boundary between land and ocean, and they die, and they get fossilized, and you can radioactively date them. And so when you do this, what you find is that the sea level was somewhere between six and nine meters higher. All right, so let me repeat that. The UN goal is to keep sea level rise to six to nine meters. Okay? So what's scary about this it, is the recent results are saying it's not going to happen in thousands of years where you can evolve. 
uh, but it may be happening in 100, 200 years because of this acceleration. And so the glacier guys have gone back to the drawing board and as they watch this thing melt and, and as they more deeply understand what is going on, they're beginning to say the climate is much more sensitive than we thought. Okay, so that's what's happening. Uh, if we do achieve the two degree warming target, uh, all that dark blue is where Boston used to be. It's still there, it's just underwater. Uh, MIT is deeply underwater. Half of Harvard is underwater. Um, Stanford has a beautiful Bayside view. <laughs> um, uh, but it happens all around the world. This is Shanghai today, uh, where you see um, the Yangtze River, the mouth of the Yangtze River. Sh Shanghai is a city of 30 million people, and the suburbs have, the suburbs of this city have populations of five and four and six million. Okay, that's the suburbs. So everything's bigger in China at the moment in terms of that, and uh, and this is uh, what. Uh, will be above water if we get two degrees. Two degrees since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so one degree from where we are today. <clears throat> so, but it's worse than that. It's not decreased the rate of carbon emission uh, because once it's up there, about 55% gets immediately absorbed by the oceans and uh, trees pick it up. And so that has a five year time scale. It's, so it's already taken into account, maybe a 10 year time scale. The other time scales of how long the carbon circulates in the atmosphere to land and, and ocean and back have very much longer time scales on the order of 10,000 years to 30,000 years. So on the time scale of that, um, once it's up there, it kind of just circulates around. So because of it, that fact, it's the total cumulative emissions that uh, we want to stay under. So that red line, 2,900 billion tons of CO2, is the UN goal of having a two-thirds probability of staying below two degrees. And um, also the UN goal was to stay below 450 parts per million, but if you include the equivalent of all the other greenhouse gases that are up there now, we're actually at 490, we're at 410 parts per million CO2, but we're 490 of everything. So um, it's going to be a matter of time. Uh, at the rate we're going, even if we cap carbon emissions, so no, no longer any increase in carbon emissions or other greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we go over that red line in 20 years. So the probability of not going over that red line, I would say, is very small. Uh, there's an ancient uh, Chinese philosopher who said something very wise, and his name is not Yogi Berra, but it could have been Yogi Berra. He, <laughs> if you don't change direction, you will end up where you're heading. <laughs> uh, and again, let me point out that all these, the cumulative greenhouse gas emissions also have occurred over the last 65 years. So forget about the time when the steam engine was first introduced. This is a recent phenomenon. All right. So there's a rapidly changing landscape of energy. I'm not going to talk about it. Well, for, I will ju br just briefly mention that the technology to find in oil and gas is getting better and better. And uh, the ability to, once you find it, to extract a higher fraction of it is getting better and better. And so the problem won't autocorrect. We won't run out of oil and gas this century, even with the current rise. Okay? It's, there's... Uh, lots of uh, high-value carbon under the ground uh, that can cook us. And so what we really need to do is we, near, we have to transition to uh, solutions that are both economically competitive but are going to be better than oil and natural gas. Um, we transitioned from the Stone Age to the Metal Ages, and nowadays we look at stones on the ground and we don't shake our heads and say, stranded assets. <laughs> uh, and so we need to get to a time and place where you don't look at the oil and, and natural gas on the ground and say stranded assets. Uh, you just say, w no, we've gone on to better things. All right. One more last mention before I go on to science, and that is um, 
we've been focused typically on electricity generation and uh, things of that nature, but it's more than that. And in particular, I just want to call your attention to the fact that agriculture and land use, including um, the emission of methane from cows, both the front and the back, uh, in, including um, emissions of over-fertilization, including all of those things, uh, the amount of greenhouse gases in land use and agriculture equals that in the electricity sector. And there's lots of low-hanging fruit to decrease carbon emissions in that sector as well. So um, anyway, all right, let me very quickly say that the landscape and renewable energy is uh, going along quite well. Uh, this is uh, an analysis based on uh, a consulting company called Lazard, and it's published in 2016, where they try to estimate the unsubsidized cost of wind and solar energy and depending on where you are and other and how windy the places are, these are the price ranges. Uh, this is um, anywhere from 32 to 62 dollars a megawatt hour, or three to six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, solar energy has plummeted by a factor of four in the last five years, and so it too has become competitive, uh, 46 to 61 dollars a megawatt hour. The cheapest source of electrical power in the United States is natural gas. It's very cheap now because the price of natural gas is very inexpensive. But in order to project over the, if you build a new natural gas plant and ask how much will it cost over the lifetime of the plant, let's say 50 years, you have to make a guess as to what the cost of natural gas will be. So what these people did is they guessed. Uh, they guessed this can be considerably lower than what we saw historically because we're finding a lot more natural gas and uh, fracking plus horizontal drilling is helping that. Uh, so it's historically much lower, but it's not going to be like uh, 250 a million BTU. I think they were saying something at like $4 or 380 something like that. Still very low. Uh, and you see natural gas is comparable. Uh, that's not the full story. Natural gas is actually better because you, when you want the electricity, you can turn it on. Okay. But in terms of uh, cost, it's, it's getting there. Uh, the renewable energy is getting there. Offshore wind, w the world has lots of resources of offshore win wind and not as much um, resistance. And so... Um, Offshore wind prices are also declining, and as you see, this is uh, some prices of uh, contracts being made in uh, Great Britain. Uh, wind prices for offshore wind, which has much higher uh, construction costs, maintenance costs, and everything, have um, going below uh, nuclear power, and um, and you also see the natural gas costs. Now, I have to say, this is subsidized. So, so uh, offshore wind is about twofold more expensive than onshore. But we're heading in the right direction. Um, one is fully expecting, well, we already have in many places of the world where the sun is very good or where the wind is very good, unsubsidized costs of about three cents a kilowatt hour. And so as the technology improves, it's going to go still lower. Uh, there's every expectation that within a decade, maybe less, uh, the cost could decline to maybe two cents a kilowatt hour. Just to let you know, this is not being done by um, uh, tree huggers only. Um, I'm uh, on the Science Council for Shell, which uh, advises a lot of the vice presidents of where they should be going and, and also the CEO. And uh, Shell thinks that by 2040, it's a guesstimate, uh, electricity in certain places of the world will be about one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Okay? So and that's an oil and gas company saying the price of electricity will come down. But not quite. The price of electricity comes down only when it's 5 or 10 or 15 percent. What if it's 50 percent or 60 percent of all electricity generated? Then it's a whole different matter because you need storage, you need backup, you need much better transmission lines. So as the price of renewals gets lower and lower, they actually have to because the backup systems and all the other uh, 
more complex infrastructure you need will also be needed, rather than having something you can just turn on when you want it. Huge opportunity in machine learning and this brave new electrical tr transmission distribution generating system. Uh, you're going to need machines that have layered controls to automatically uh, distribute, manage the two-way flows. We have technologies that can port electricity there, but not there, just as we can send information there in the internet on the fiber, but not there. And so um, we need the machines to figure out how to manage this very complex distribution system in real time, uh, make more accurate predictions of uh, energy use and weather predictions and everything else. So that will be happening. Now let me talk about energy storage. Here's my favorite picture of energy storage. When the wind blows, you pump water. Th that's when you need the energy to pump the water. When you want the water, you open the valve, much less energy. We forgot we did it this way <laughs> because we got used to throwing on a switch, so we have to learn something like that again. Um, in Stanford University, we, didn't, we used to have a cogen plant, a natural gas power plant that powers the university, but um, it was torn down, but we needed more electricity. So instead, what they did is they built uh, two big cold water tanks and one big hot water tank, and then they used heat pumps, and they bought electricity at night, very cheap electricity, two cents or less a kilowatt hour. They chill the water in the co cold tanks, they heat the water in hot tanks, and during the day, they either keep the place cool or warm. That's it. Okay, so the big water tanks are a battery, and then you use heat pumps. We also, you know, take advantage of the fact that it's cooler at night in uh, the Bay Area. Going back to pump storage, uh, this can be done at a larger scale. In Chile, there's very steep cliffs. Um, these cliffs are actually 600 meters high, not feet, meters. Uh, the Boulder Dam is 200 feet high. Okay, so it's a very high cliffs right next to the ocean. And so they uh, have a big solar farm, 600 megawatt solar farm that they are in the process of trying to build. But to that, they're gonna add 300 megawatts of pump storage. And those on the right hand side, you see uh, over here, if the pointer, yeah. Um, these are little man-made lakes. So the idea is you pump salt water up there. And then when you want the energy, you let it flow back. The round trip efficiency time of this whole system of pumping the water up the hill and the frictional losses and then letting it come back to spin the pump turbine that pumped it up the hill is about 85% efficient. It's actually uh, better than flow batteries. Uh, it's, it's very good. I mean, lithium ion sealed batteries are better, but, but it's better than other forms of storage. So let me talk about batteries and we're getting into electrochemistry. Um, batteries have made remarkable progress since uh, the first EVs started to come out around 2006, 2007. It was very, very high cost, maybe uh, $1,200 to $1,500 in cost, and they plummeted. Uh, nowadays, in 2016, 17, they're around here, maybe $250, $300 manufacturing costs for EV batteries. The Tesla Gigafactory says that uh, they will, when they get to nearly full production, they will have costs of $125 a kilowatt hour. I put the line at $150 just to say, well, just give it a little uh, buffer. And, um, and so what's remarkable about all this is these gold symbols over here were what the projections were in 2014. So like solar energy, progress in the cost of batteries, and uh, believe it or not, in the volume energy density performance of batteries is actually faster than what the experts predicted. Believe it or not, because uh, yes, I know your cell phone battery wears out always an hour too soon, um, but, but it, it has improved. Now, there's a huge shift in battery paradigms. Before, our batteries had a stable host. It's, uh, for example, the anode was graphite and uh, little bits of uh, lithium. 
and now we go to what we would call an unstable host. Um, and so what does that mean? It means instead of lithium intercalating and then going over to a cathode, uh, and it, you have significant bond breakings, the host atoms are now moving. By host atoms moving, I mean the volume change in a graphite battery used to be a few percent. But now we're looking at advanced battery designs, let's say lithium uh, silicon batteries, uh, lith on the sulfur on the cathode side, lithium metal, where the volume change could easily be 100 to 200 to up to 400 percent change. And so the question is, how does the battery stay stable with these large volume changes? And so far the answer is, yes, how does it stay stable? <laughs> As in, it, it, there are no commercial metal, well, there are actually commercial lithium metal batteries out there now. Uh, they use, the, but the volume change is not. They use a lot of lithium metal and they let a little bit of it fluctuate. And, um, and so there are tricks to keep the lithium stable. Uh, but in any case, uh, the lithium sulfur, there are no commercially viable ones there. Lots of publications. Uh, including ones we do, but um, nothing really yet viable. Okay, so this, these are the challenges. This is where batteries are in weight per, uh, energy per unit weight on the x-axis, energy per unit volume on the y-axis. And lead acid is down here, pretty close to zero. Uh, the uh, lithium ion batteries, that were introduced by John Goodenough, the lithium cobalt oxide and also the iron phosphate are in this range over here. There's the lithium polymer that is found in a lot of the uh, portable laptop computers and cell phones are s essentially the same type of chemistries over here. Lithium metal uh, could be over here. And so um, right now, um, people are beginning to deliver to uh, OEMs uh, lithium ion batteries with a watt hour per liter of somewhere around 750 and perhaps higher <coughs> samples uh, up to 800 uh, watt hours per liter. That's pretty good considering they started about um, 250. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, uh, the energy density volume per unit energy per unit volume, which is what cell phones really care about. They don't care about the weight. They care about, can I make my phone skinnier? Uh, uh, it has improved fourfold. The improvement in energy per unit weight has not improved that much. It's still around, cell is around 200 uh, watt hours per kilogram. But um, there is you know, an optimism that we will get to somewhere around here whether it's five or 10 years, we don't know. Uh, the optimism is not completely crazy. I'm on the board of a battery company and we're actually testing stuff there and beginning to give samples to companies so that they can you know, beat on it and throw nails at it and all this other stuff. So, so it's not completely crazy uh, that uh, you, you can, we can soon see maybe 400 watt hours per kilogram and eight, over 800 uh, watt hours per liter. Um, uh, the person I'm doing all my battery research and a lot of my, all my electrochemistry is uh, Yi Shui, who's um, that's a picture of Yi. Um, and so the moral of that story is, I used to be young too, <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, uh, we met and started working together about three and a half years ago, four years ago. And um, he was pointing out, many people know this, that um, the carbon anode, for example, uh, has maximum efficiency down here, and that's what we all use now. Uh, one of his early claims to fame was the design of a silicon anode. So instead of for each lithium atom, you need six or seven carbons, for each silicon atom, you can put four, a, a little bit over four lithium ions. So the ratio is completely reversed, okay? So the theoretical efficiency of silicon is much, much higher. And of course, um, metal is the best. If you have a pure metal uh, battery, uh, you have a higher potential and then all of it is used. Uh, there's no mass overhead. And so those are 
<coughs> targets, whether we really get there or not remains to be seen. In this company that Yi founded called Amprius, uh, we have there a, a mass producing tool. It's a tool, it's not in production yet, but it's a tool which takes polymer backing on the back end and goes, it's a 10, 20 meter long thing. And from just sheets of rolled plastic, it goes in there, puts on um, the silicon and lithiates it and everything and mushes it together and then it rolls it up again and what comes out are, is uh, a silicon anode uh, that we are beginning to give to manufacturers, automobile manufacturers and other things. So they said, okay, you, you know, for them in their research divisions, they can say, here's a, here's a silicon anode with this higher density. The ultimate goal, uh, the ultimate short-term goal is to go to um, all metal. The trouble with all metal is when y what you have is this metal lithium, it's very reactive, and so there is automatically forms a solid electrolyte interface uh, between the lithium metal and the interface. That's great, but it's not that strong, and once you begin to charge it more rapidly, or do other things or charge it more repeatedly, there's a, always a possibility that a defect may occur that breaks this SEI layer. And once you break the SEI layer, then the lithium begins to shoot up in a dendrite. And because the field is higher there, uh, when the, you're taking the lithium from the cathode, you're recharging the battery. So you're taking lithium from the cathode and sticking it back on the anode side. Uh, this dendrite grows because the field is highest there. And so that's what kills metal batteries. The way around it that people have found um, is that you make a new interface layer that's stronger. I was, um, when I was at LBNL, uh, there was a polymer chemist there who invented a cobalt polymer. So part of the polymer was a standard electrolyte that could, could, could conduct lithium ions very easily. But the other polymer was the stuff they used to make football helmets. And when they mix these cobalt polymers together, the, it's a, uh, now, if you could grow these cobalt polymers to be ordered, that would be terrific, but it turns into a big soup. And um, it does prevent dendrites from forming, but you have to run at elevated temperatures because um, the conductivity is less. Nevertheless, uh, that company, so I was advising that company, but because I was director of LBNL, I had to do it for free and, and with no winks and nods, uh, like what we might see today, never mind. Well, <laughs> uh, I did it for free because I actually learned a lot about batteries uh, by giving advice to this company. It's been bought by a German automobile battery manufacturer auto company, so it's still alive. The idea is that it's okay to keep the battery at 60, 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, you, you need a little battery power to keep it warm, but if you make it well insulated, you can keep it there for many days without much power. It's just a little thermos bottle. It literally is. A, uh, so that's one of the ideas. Ideally, you'd like to have a battery uh, material that works at both high temperatures and low temperatures. The other bad part about batteries is that at very high temperatures, uh, it's bad. So you have to use the battery to keep it cool. So if you park an electric vehicle in a Phoenix garage next to an airport, that battery is keeping the ba battery cool before it gets destroyed. And if you're gone a week in 100 degree weather, you don't have a battery anymore. Okay, so, so that's the downside of, uh, of batteries technology today, both on the hot and the cold side. Um, all right, so this is describing a paper where it's one of several attempts uh, we've done to make uh, different SCI layers. Uh, this happens to be just evaporated carbon. You evaporate on, how do you make this thing? You take polystyrene spheres and you pile up three monolayers and by the time you're three monolayers, it's very regular. And then you just flash some carbon on it and you can lift it off, you can take it, you can bend it, it, it sticks together, lithium ions go through, uh, all good stuff. 
and w without this added SCI layer, the battery begins to fall apart by making dendrites. This is cycle number 50, 100, 150, um, but this is what happens when you have this little layer. It's still not ready for prime time in all honesty, but at least it shows that there's a philosophy approach to getting uh, much more durable stuff. Okay, so um, now let me, let me just say that um, the prediction for electric vehicles of any type, so this is either going to be battery or plug-in hybrid or fuel cell, is uh, actually going radical uh, changes in evaluation. Uh, the 2015 forecast is shown in blue, and the red shows the 2016 forecast, which is about eh, five times faster. So in one year, the uptake is predicted to be five times faster. It's exactly the same thing that happened with solar. In one or two years, the uptake was predicted to be five times faster because it got so cheap so fast that uh, it was surprised everybody. But this is not why it's happening. It's not getting so cheap that fast. It's getting cheaper, but it, you still have performance issues. And here's the issue. So let's talk about the last century and the transition from horse and buggy, uh, horsepower to horsepower, as in internal combustion engine power. And this is New York City, 1890s, a lot of horses. Uh, this is Detroit, 1920, similar in New York City, virtually no horses, um, streetcars, and automobiles. So automobile technology, you could say, was superior, but think about what had to happen. You had to have a completely new infrastructure, a complete gasoline, oil gasoline supply chain. You'd have to have better paved roads. You had to have uh, a dis distribution system, uh, and um, you got to drive the price down so people can afford the cars. But the real thing that pushed this is there was an environmental pollution issue. What was the issue? 160,000 horses in New York City, producing three to four million pounds of horse manure a day. It was piling up in vacant lots one story high. Uh, 40,000 gallons of horse urine a day. So this is um, a, a pollution problem that you simply can't say, I don't, I don't see it, I see nothing. <laughs> uh, you smell a lot as well. Okay, so, so what is happening is very recently, only in the last five or 10 years, um, medical science is beginning to understand that two things, nitrogen oxides and particulate matter are far more dangerous than they thought. It, we didn't know this 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And so that's what's stimulating the car sales. Now China is the biggest EV or and plug-in EV, but mostly EV market in the world. The orange is China's sales per year, registrations per year. Uh, so 400,000 new registrations. Uh, it's the new car sales in China for EVs is as close to 1% of total fleet sales. Okay, it's in the in Palo Alto it might be 1%, but uh, <laughs> not in the United States. It's like a third or four, uh, something like that. So, so China has surpassed everybody, including the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Europe put together. Um, I should also point, make a plug for uh, fuel cell cars. Uh, they are now commercially available, uh, and um, a DOE employee, Sunita, who's in the audience, I think somewhere, uh, picked me up <laughs> in, uh, in uh, what was it, a Toyota. Uh, and um, so they also are made great progress in the fuel cell capabilities. The advantage of a hydrogen fuel cell is that uh, it can fuel much quicker than an electric vehicle that exists today. Um, and it has about a 360 mile driving range and the long range test last is about 280. Um, the disadvantage is you need, again, a very different infrastructure for hydrogen and you need a 
cheap way of making clean hydrogen. Uh, by clean hydrogen, I mean not gas reforming. So uh, in actual fact, if people ask me who I think will win, I said, I want both of them to win uh, because there are places for both in the market. Which one wins, I don't know, or if there is going to be a winner. Um, I do know that um, a, a car that charges may be four times faster. So instead of the fast charge Tesla, which is 140 miles in 20 minutes, you can go 140 miles in five minutes. The total range is not going to be 140 miles. It's going to be 300. But if you can go 140 miles in five minutes of charge with a connector that's this big, that's OK. And most, you need that because most people don't own garages. People who live in cities, for the most part, are not that, they're not rich enough to own a garage. So, um, so you need that fast charge and all the other properties. So, so that's what's happening. Now, with fuel cells, we don't really know what the real costs are. The manufacturers are selling these at very large subsidies uh, hidden to the public. But in terms of what you really want to go of, there's uh, kind of roadmap, technological roadmaps of what you can do with systems, production, dispersion, all that stuff. OK, so let's just say that we'll see what happens. Now let me move on to air pollution. This is China, Beijing on a bad air day. Uh, talking about particulate matter, PM 2.5. Uh, the largest epidemiology studies are coming up with the conclusions that um, it doesn't take much. 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5 gives you a 40% chance, increased chance of getting lung cancer. Um, that's a bad news story because the World Health Organization standard for clean air is 10 micrograms per cubic meter. That's how much we did not know how dangerous this is. Next question, what's the average air quality in Beijing? Well, we have the US Embassy now has records. And the answer is 100 micrograms per cubic meter. So the math is you multiply 1.4 10 times, and you get it appears to be worse than smoking a package of cigarettes a day, except everybody smokes from day zero. Now, so, well, then I'll hide on bad air days. This is the average. Uh, but uh, most home ventilation systems uh, let in about half of this stuff. They don't filter out the smallest particles. So that's bad. Um, one of Yi's people discovered something um, very nice. Uh, Shang Wu, I think, is the first author in this. And then it is if you take nanofibers, electrospun, nanofibers, the polymer fibers, not a couple of microns in diameter, but a couple hundred nanometers in diameter, they discovered by accident that it could filter out uh, these very fine particles. In fact, the filter is so good, it can let 30% of the light through, and yet, so it's very little impedance to the air, and yet it's getting over 98% of the PM 2.5 particles. And so, um, so you told me about this, and, uh, and he wanted me to help further this. And so I let my arm get twisted. And so for the first time in my life, I was willing to start a company at Stanford. That sounds so anti-Stanford, I know. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, actually, eight companies grew out of my group members starting companies. But I just wanted to stay focused on doing science. But I said, OK, this is so important. I'll, I'll help you with this. But by the way, I think I know what the mechanism is. I said, oh, really? I said, yeah, it's like static electricity. If you have a charged rod and you put it near neutral particles, pieces of paper, the paper gets polarized by the electric field. So even though it's neutral, the charges that are attracted to the rod feel a slightly stronger force than the charges away from it, and the paper goes to the rod. Now, once the dust particle or PM particle goes to the nanopolymer, you use chemistry to keep it stuck there. And um, so he says, well, how'd you know that? Because we didn't, we didn't, we don't know what this is. Oh, I think, I think I, this is what I suspect because that's what I got my Nobel Prize for. <laughs> uh, I use electric fields to polarize neutral particles 
And in particular, uh, if you use a strong electric field of a laser and the oscillating f uh, electric charges on the atom or a molecule or a cell uh, are held in there, the field strength is strongest at the focus of the laser. Yes, the field is going up and down. But as long as the field, when it's pointing up, it, the charges align, so they're also pointing as if it's in a static field. And when the field reverses, the charges reverse. It's like static electricity. So the, so, so we'd start doing experiments. It appears to be that you, 95% uh, of the particles are neutral. Uh, number one, number two. If you make the fiber zero charge, it doesn't trap. Them. You make it positive or negative, it chops. It chops a little bit higher in one side than the other for equal bosses. So and and then you do back the analytical calculation. You find that the smaller they are, the more less mass they have, and they can spiral in better. So these actually work best for the small guys. So anyway, it's kind of ironic. Never mind. Think of a world, I'm um, getting low in time, and so I'm going to wrap up in three minutes. Think of a world of two cents a kilowatt hour. All of a sudden, electrochemistry becomes maybe affordable. Several things. And so I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is Chong Lu, who's now a co-directed postdoc between Yi and myself, of work she did on using electrolysis, electrochemicals, or chemistry rather, to capture uranium. And the cool thing about this is, I'll just very briefly mention, not walk you through the diagrams, you have some charge, and you've got these ions, and you've got uranium ions, you've got other ions, and you draw them onto the surface. Now, what happens is you then allow um, some chemistry occurs, so you make a neutral uranium oxide. The other stuff doesn't undergo this chemical reaction. You reverse the electric field, you throw the other stuff off. The uranium still sticks. And then you do it again, and the uranium comes back on, except oop, it sticks stuck on the other uranium oxide. And so instead of building up a monolayer, you build up a macroscopic thickness of uranium. So that's the fundamental idea. Okay? And it works. And because of that, you can extract uranium much more efficiently. Okay. So then I said, okay, that's great. So I started chatting with Yi and Chang and said, why don't we, you know, uranium, we don't know whether it's going to be here because nuclear reactors have gotten really expensive. Uh, electricity will be here. What about lithium? Lithium, too, has gotten very expensive. And this is July 2013 to 2016. This is the price of lithium. Part of this is speculation because this blue is the amount of lithium trading that was going on. And the brown is actually taking delivery. So when you see a lot of trading and not much delivery, you know that people are trying to make money. Those very, very uh, good people in our society who don't do anything except trade. <laughs> Never mind. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I don't think they're here. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> we actually do stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> in any case, uh, this is an old slide showing the uh, trends in lithium and the demand projections of demand. Lithium is used in portable batteries, it's used in glass and ceramics, it's used in other things. And these lines, the green dotted and black line, are projections for EV demand. All right? But that was the projection made a couple of years ago. But today, what is happening is if you believe the projections I just told you about that were made this year and last year, the projection for the demand of lithium by 2032 is first that a, a hundred million EVs will be there on the road. You do the back calculation and it's 2.4 million tons of lithium. Okay, this is more than an order, it's, it's an order magnitude higher than this graph. So the truth is, I think somewhere between this graph and maybe a factor of 20 above. And then if you're a factor of 20 above, you do have a lithium problem. Because if you have a lithium problem in price now, you're going to have a bigger lithium problem. And so guess what the financial people are doing? The equity guys. They're buying up lithium mine holdings. It's wonderful. Not really. So... My job is to make sure they don't make a lot of money. <laughs>
And how do you not make a lot of money is you've got to have another better source of lithium. And so it turns out lithium in the Earth's crust is as abundant as nitrogen and chlorine. Okay? It's not rare. It's just not formed in ores you can easily separate. It's just like rare earths aren't rare. And so if you look at the current, this is a review article, if you look at the current mineral and very salty lake brines, you have 16 million tons, metric tons, you have 27 million metric tons. And if you look at the seawater, you're in 9,000 metric tons. Uh, 9,000 million metric tons, sorry. So you're about 10,000 times over. And so that will keep things at bay, and it no longer depends on having to go to Chile or some special place. You can, you know, extract it from the ocean. I'll, I'll skip this. I'll skip the earlier work and just say that seawater is particularly hard because the concentration of seawater, the molar concentration, is 1 in 20,000. And so you want to extract lithium. You don't want to extract sodium, potassium, anything else. And um, the good news is that, um, now I'm sorry I can't tell you because I'm out of time, but also the patent guys say I'm not allowed to tell you. But anyway, so I'll tell you the results. In one cycle pass, you go from 20,000 to 1 to 1 to 1 with seawater. Once you get up to brine uh, of salty lakes, like Salt Lake, you know, in Utah, or flow back water. Actually, when you drill for oil in Texas and Oklahoma, you get one barrel of oil, you get five to ten barrels of salt water, which is much higher concentration lithium to sodium ratio than brine in, this, in the oceans. So that wastewater it actually has a lot of money in it. And so I've asked my people at Shell to give me some uh, flow back water. Uh, and see how much we can extract. We can put in the fake amounts, and we know we, when we get that salt concentration of lithium to sodium, we get 99% lithium in one cycle. Okay, so, so that's exciting. Another project uh, Ian and I are working on is uh, soon to be submitted is a way to use carbon dioxide and turn it into hydrogen and carbon monoxide. But the normal way you do this with electrochemistry is you've got to dissolve the carbon dioxide in the water, and then there's limited solubility, and then you've got to move water around, and that's a problem, and you've got this big footprint. So here's uh, something many of you might have known, but I think many people don't know it. The cost of electrolysis is not making the overpotential 20% better. It's the footprint of the electrolysis and the electricity. The electricity is going to be taking care of itself, and I tell you how you can, in question and answer, how you can run it 24-7. But it's the size of the plant that is a big determining factor of the capex. So you've got to make the electrolysis or whatever plant you make very compact, which means high density, which means you've got to try to get around planar geometry. If you can do that, the cheap electricity is going to take care of itself. Okay, the electricity cost for mining lithium is in the third or fourth decimal place. It's so um, lithium at twenty dollars a kilogram, is, you can make money, but uh, you need much, much better stuff to reduce carbon dioxide to hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And the idea is to mimic the geometry of the lung. You've got a series of big pipes going to smaller pipes, going to smaller pipes, to small, smaller pipes. And eventually, it gets into the alveoli, these little chambers. And in this alveoli chamber, you've got a membrane that passes gases, carbon dioxide, and oxygen back and forth. And it doesn't allow blood and water to get back and forth. And so there, too, we want something like that, a series of pipes. The big pipes are smaller, they're smaller. And, and eventually you get to uh, the equivalent of a VLI um, where you allow water to come in contact with the gas, CO2, and, the, and you allow your electrolysis to happen. But when you evolve gases to hydrogen and oxygen, you don't pick them up in the fluid. They go back out as in you exhale. So you don't have to inhale and exhale. It's kind of a continuous system. So, so that means the mass transport friction and everything else decreased, the bubble formation energy goes away, lots of things improve, and oh, by the way, it can be three-dimensional. So this is potentially very exciting. Uh, 
and we're going to be publishing, uh, submitting in a week or two. I'm going to stop this. This is some really cool stuff about looking at sulfur. I just want to show this movie. This is sulfur in an electrolyte, droplets of liquid sulfur on a nickel mesh. You change the potential and they evaporate. You put reverse the potential, the sulfur out of the electrolyte comes back into uh, from solution and deposits on the metal, but you notice those things will really look like liquids. And um, they are liquids, but you see the bubbles form. If you introduce a solid uh, crystalline sulfur onto these liquids and they touch, they solidify, so we know they're, they're uh, solid. Uh, this is a sped up movie. Uh, and um, what's really interesting about this is these experiments are done at room temperature, and in fact, you can go all the way so far to minus 30 C, and the sulfur is still a liquid. Well, when does sulfur normally stay uh, a solid? It's at 115 centigrade. It goes from a liquid to a solid. So this is very uh, supercooled sulfur. In terms of where you have supercooling relative to the melting temperature, in terms of just raw you know, what's the fraction of the melting temperature minus where you can, you either form a glass or you form um, um, a solid, a crystalline solid. It's close to 0.4, which uh, to the best of our knowledge, we don't know anything else that has that much super cooling. Um, the reason why is uh, you can do this is it doesn't wet the surface. Uh, there are no impurities. These are micron-sized droplets. Uh, you can also do this with water. So the next step is we will actually, so we can get supercooled liquids. We can probably get supercooled water this way because it's not touching any surface. There's no surface to nucleate on. So either it homonucleates which means there's some spontaneous fluctuation that allows it to solidify, or else it turns into a glass. Okay, and uh, we don't know, but in the meantime, as it supercools, there's lots of renormalization theories. Now I'm talking as a physicist, not an electrochemist. Uh, so that's the trouble with physicists do electrochemistry. They look and say, ah, there's neat physics there. Um, so forgive me, but the we can measure the viscosity uh, of this by bouncing a laser beam off the bubble. And uh, then you use some optical force to push on it. And you do this as a function of frequency and you can back out both the surface tension and the uh, inertia, the viscosity. All right, let me go back and here I'm stopping um, and re-emphasize what electrochemistry can do. If you think of turning stuff into chemicals, it could be electrochemical or petrochemical, thermochemical, or whatever. But I think the, oh, and I, we can capture CO2 as well, and there are big advances being made on that. So once you have captured CO2, you want to recycle it. And the first step is to turn it into hydrogen and CO, and then later over here. Um, also, you know, you can split water to make hydrogen and oxygen, and then you begin to build up a liquid hydrocarbon. But the first thing you make is hydrogen and CO and oxygen. And so for that reason, uh, there's going to be space for EVs. There's going to be space for EVs based on battery, conventional batteries, space for EVs based on uh, hydrogen. Um, now, in the end, you want a liquid hydrocarbon, something that would be stored at room temperature. Uh, why? Because if you ask the question, how much does it cost to ship oil anywhere around the world and store it in these big tanks? Uh, and the answer is about two cents a gallon. Okay? So these are the intercontinental transmission lines. So you want to take cheap, clean energy, turn it into a chemical fuel, stick it in a tank, and then ship it. And at that point, and with r captured CO2, uh, this is how we actually get around uh, stopping. We can begin to really phase out fossil fuel. And so what I see in all of this, as you noted, is electrochemistry is going to be at the heart of this. Okay, thank you. <laughs>